off last time talking about the post back. And the idea of the post back is that it's advantageous to have the code that processes the page on the same within the same PHP file as the code for the form. The reason for that is if there's any errors in the input, you can simply choose after the user has submitted whether to display the form or to display the results. So because of that, we moved some of the code or a, and we're in the process of moving the code from a separate page to the page that has the form. Now, the thing that we have to do with that, the thing that we have to keep in mind, is now we have a page that serves two purposes. Some of the times it's going to be used for displaying the form, and some of the times it's going to be used for displaying the results. Now, we know we're going to be displaying the form the first time through. And displaying the results, our assumption is right now that we're going to display the results the second time through. But that's not actually correct, right? We're going to display the results the second time through if there's no errors in the input, all right? So if there's errors in the input, we actually don't want to display the results. We want to redisplay the form and redisplay the form with the value that was entered. So with that in mind, we're going to pick up where we left off last time and <coughs> move some code around, continue to move code around I should say. And again, because of the goofy way the security is set up on this, I'm going to do my editing of the files on the desktop. And then when I have them complete, or when I've made a change, I'm going to move it to C, INET, PUB, WW root so that we can test it. We need to do that, of course, because these are server-side script files, and therefore they have to run through a web server before they work. All right, so... We were looking at the post back form, so I'm going to edit that guy. And I actually can probably copy a lot of code over from our earlier version. Like, for example, I could content I could copy all this stuff. Actually I can go even a little bit further. Maybe. And I can paste it right here. Here's where we do our calculation. You can't see anything. Ah. Well, that's a problem now, isn't it? doing is we're copying this code from our old processing page and we're going to put it in this spot 
If you remember, we're using the presence of the button on the query string to determine whether or not this is the first time through or the second time through. First time through when the page loads, the URL will not contain on the query string the button. After we've clicked submit, the URL will contain the name of the button on the query string. So we're checking to see if there's a value for the button on the query string. If there is, we know that it's the second time through, so we're going to attempt to process the data. So I'm going to paste that right here. And I think I have a couple duplicate start and end PHP tags, so let me take care of those. And I should save it, and let me copy it over to the CI NetPub root. And if I did everything right, it should work. There's no reason why it shouldn't work. So I copied it over to the root. Let's go and run it. Localhost. Slash. And what did I call it? form post back. All right. First time through it works, right? There's nothing on the query string, so therefore it displays the form. I enter in an amount. Convert. And oh, that was weird. Oh, I know what's wrong. I did not, I'll bet I did not change the action. getting, it's not working. All right. What are we going to do about this? Well, it worked the second time because I called the other page. I called one of my earlier versions. Well, the one thing that we found, remember, is that our PHP is not set to report errors. So we're going to find the PHP any file and we're going to something that says about reporting errors. Pardon me? Yes, we could. Yes. Display error 
errors equals off. We'll say display errors equals on. All right, it's not letting me save it here. Oh, it does. I stand corrected. No, nope, it does not. So I'm going to save it on the desktop. And I will copy it over there. undefined function. What did I forget to do? No. Simpler than that. Sure. <laughs> you'd, you'd be You'd get more points as a psychic if you knew it without looking at line 19, but I guess we can look at that. Line 19. So you mean where we have all the functions stored, we forgot to change something? You're getting warm. Where are all the functions? Let's put it that way. In our include file. In our include file. And where is our include file? It ain't in here. So we forgot to include the include file. All right. So, I'm actually glad that error happened. Um, it's a good way to cover when you make a mistake in class to say that you're glad that, you, that the error happened. Um, if I had more experience, I'd even say that I plan to have that error. All right, I'm not quite up to that point yet. But it is good because I think it's important to see the troubleshooting. Um, you literally, you know, how do I want to say this? I probably could have stared at the code for I don't know how long without realizing I forgot the include file because I'd be looking for an error. You know, I'd be looking for a semicolon in the wrong place or something along those lines. Whereas this tells me exactly what was wrong. I can't find that function. Immediately I think, well, where is that function? That function's in the include file. Oops, that's my problem right there. So let's go in and edit this so that the include file is in there. And the include file is called currency.inc. So I'm going to go in the notepad and I'm going to go and edit it to include that include file. And hopefully we should get some happier results. Save it, copy it, paste it, replace, OK. This is one thing about PHP. Those of you that have done programming in other languages, like for example, um, C Sharp, all right? C sharp, if we didn't have the name of a function, right, or if we didn't have a name of function in our program, what would happen? Would get an error immediately when you compiled. All right? P uh, C sharp is a compiled language. So you run it through and the compiler looks and makes sure everything's in its right place. PHP is what's called an interpreted language. In other words, it does a translation, it does a compilation, if you will as it's processing the file. So it doesn't do it like beforehand, which means that if there's an error, it doesn't give the error until it actually goes and tries to run it. 
So it gives runtime errors rather than compilation errors. And that's kind of annoying. All right? Runtime errors are tough because runtime errors are situational. In other words, now in this case, it was still pretty clear that there was an error, right? But when I loaded the page initially, I didn't get an error. Why? Because it didn't try to call that function yet. Only when I try to call the function do I get that error. Now in our case, I'm trying to call the function every time I hit the submit button. But if you can imagine, there may be a, a function that only gets called under some very special circumstances. And if you don't have that function named correctly, you could test all the ordinary circumstances and it could look like it works just fine. But in some rare case where some goofy function that almost never gets called gets called, boom, then you get the error. Okay, I'm optimistic now that it is going to work. And it does. Yay. So once we did this, once we remember to put the include file in, actually changing it from a post back uh, or from going to another page to a post back was pretty easy. It's just a matter of copying code. But we're not quite there yet because if you notice, must enter a number, well, the form still disappears. Or if we enter in something that's non-numeric, the form disappears. Well, how are we going to fix that? All right, we're going to fix that by making our page smarter. In other words, right now, our criteria is simply if the button is on the query string, then process it. And we look right off to see if it is numeric or not. And if it's not numeric, we display an error message. And then we never get into this part because this part only gets called the first time through when there's nothing on the button. What we're going to do is we're going to tweak this code a little bit so we don't have an if and else. Let me, let me write up on the board what we're going to do. Now this is what we have in pseudocode. The button is pressed and we're doing this. We're looking to see if it's valid. If it's valid, then we're processing it. If it's not valid, then we're displaying the error. If it's not valid, though, this display form is part of that else statement. So we're never hitting it to redisplay the form. So what we're going to do is we're going to do something like this. sort of error variables. 
that we're going to use later on. So we don't simply display the error message, we just display or, or we just record an error, an error variable. Then we look and we don't display this only if it's the first time through. We check to see if it's the first time through or there's an error. And in that case, if it's the first time through or it's an error, then we display the um, form again. So let's go and let's make this happen. variables up here. Variable for the first time, and it's, I'm going to assume it's true until we find out otherwise. And I'm going to assume there's no errors until we find out otherwise. Now, we could write this a variety of different ways, but this is the approach I'm going to take. If is set, get button submit, what's the value of first time? It's not the first time through, right? So I can set that first time variable to false. Because what does is set button submit mean? It means is there something on the query string for the field button submit? When will there be something on there? Not the first time, because when the first time it loads, there's nothing on the query string. Each subsequent time, though, when I click the submit button, there's going to be a value for button submit. So if there's something in the button submit field on the query string, then I know it's not the first time through. So. I initialize it to true. If the submit button has been clicked, I change it to false. All right, fair enough. I'm going to go here. Still testing if it's numeric. And if it's numeric, then we know it's valid. So we can leave error flag set to true. However, if it's not numeric, I don't necessarily want to simply echo the display. I want to continue on and display the form. So I'm going to set dollar sign error to true. So now this is not going to be an else, it's going to be another if. And the if is going to say if first time or error, then I want to display the form. The two vertical lines like this are an or. An OR in an IF statement means that if either of the two or both of the two are true, then the whole IF statement is true. So if it's the first time through, then we're going to display the form. If it's not the first time tr through, but there's been an error, we're going to display the form again. All right. How come I don't have this? I, this is another way I could code the same thing. 
Well, first time and error are already Booleans. So I don't have to say, does it equal true? I can simply test their value. That value already is a true or a false. Remember, in if statements, your expression is a Boolean. All right? It's, your expression is a expression that evaluates to either true or false. Well, the variable already is either true or false, so we don't need to do a conditional. So that is the equivalent of that. That's true in virtually every programming language. So if you have something that's defined as a variable and you want to use it in an if statement, you could just say if and the name of the variable. And that's nice because it, it sort of increases the readability of the code. I mean, if you're looking at this, even without a comment, when do I execute this block of code? Well, if it's the first time for the page or there's an error. All right. Now, if we did this right, it should work. sure this part still works. It does. Let's put nothing in. We get the form again. Let's put something that's non numeric. We get the form again. Now, it's better than it was, but it's still not ideal. Right? What's wrong with the way it works now? Yeah, it, 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 sure enough, it displays the form, but it doesn't give us an error message. Now, in this case, this form is simple, right? We're only evaluating one error. So if there's an error, we know that it's an error with the dollar amount, all right? In other forms, we could have, uh, you know, if there was other forms that had multiple fields, there could be an error with the name, the email address, the dollar amount, the address, and so on down the line. So in this case, we only need one error flag. We could, however, if we had a bigger form with more error flag, with more fields um, that we were validating, we could make sure um, and have a second error flag. So we could have an error dollar. Uh, one thing that we could do that I'll leave to you to try if you want to is Validate to make sure that they've picked something, either some combination of yen, euros, and pounds. All right? That would be a good exercise to see if you could extend this to do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to display an error message. Do I always want to display the error message? No. When do I want to display the error message? If, in fact, there was an error. All right? So I don't want to display it the first time through. You don't want to, it's not, you know, it's kind of annoying to yell at people that you haven't entered in a dollar amount when they just got to the form, right? However, the second time through, it's perfectly acceptable to yell at them because they forgot to enter in a value. So I'm going to put in a PHP block here, and I'm going to say if dollar sign error Echo must enter a number. Click that, boom, error must enter a number. I put in a valid number. And again,
again, you could validate for that and have a separate error message for that. I could also do things like change the style of the text box or the style, style of the label or something. Let's do that. I'm going to go in here and I'm going to create a CSS. Underline and make red any errors. done anything to change the color yet all right so just as a warning but I did put the label in here and I click convert and it comes up with that how would I change this so that label gets the error class instead of what it gets now how do I change this so that if there is an error that label gets assigned the error class. Otherwise, it gets assigned the normal class. You're getting warm. We're going to echo a line. All right. What, what do we want to echo if it's an error? Class equals error. What do we want to echo if it's normal? class equals normal. Where do we want to echo that? Um, you could, but that's a long way around. We can do it simpler. And in fact, this illustrates the agony and the ecstasy of PHP. All right. This shows the power of PHP, but it also shows why PHP can be maddening. Because I can write smack dab in the middle of my label tag, pop into PHP mode, and say, I want PHP to write a little bit of my HTML code. That's too much. <laughs> All right, yeah, cover your eyes and ears then if this, if this gets too intense. This is where things like indenting and all that comes in very handy. All right. So I can then say if error, I want to echo. class equals error. Otherwise, 
class equals normal. Save that. Copy this guy into here. First time through, class is normal, there's an error, boom, we get that class. This is almost along the lines of the question you were asking the other day, David, about mixing stuff up. You can, in a very similar way, you can, you can mix and match. Now again, this is, this comes in really handy sometimes. This can also lead to very confusing code, so you have to be very careful about formatting your code so it's obvious. write a function. And, and you're right. I mean, that, that's... So let's write a function that says... And, and what do you think the argument to this function should be? You'd pass in the error flag. And what's this function going to output? The class. The class that we want, the thing that we want to output. So I'm going to say echo. Choose class. And I'm going to give it dollar sign error as a flag. down here, or up here, doesn't really matter where. I kind of like having all my functions at the top, but I guess it really doesn't matter. I could declare a function that says function choose class dollar sign arg error error equals that. I could say result equals and then I can return dollar sign result. So I like your observation there. Everyone has their own sort of style of programming. Um, I like this because this um, makes it very easy and, and doesn't decrease the readability of my code that much. In other words, like you said before, the other way was very intrusive. All right? The other way we had a block of code. Where here, I'm just sticking in a little snippet, tiny little 
little snippet. And what's more, imagine if I had other fields on this with other air flags, all right? If I had, uh, you know, a name, address, telephone number, and then I had an air name, air address, air telephone number, I could call the same function to change the class of those other fields, all right? So that would be advantageous for that as well. As far as what programmers do in the real world, you, you know, you're going to see any, a, a range of things. But I, I would argue this is a better approach, the way you described it. Now, we got one little problem. This works fine if we go and do that. But what if we type in some garbage? I wanted to type in 123, and I type in 12E. All right? Or I type in some garbage. Tells me there's an error, but the user could be confused and say, I entered something valid in. All right. Now again, in the case of a number, you know. But they might not realize that their fingers were on the wrong row of the keys or something like that. And that could be disorienting to the user. So what do we want to do here? Display their entered value. How do I do that? Repeat that, please. Save it to a variable and echo it for them. Um, yes. We can do that. And... Where do I... Echo it though. Okay. You're 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 like ninety five percent of the way there. We just need to close the loops here. Right. And then during the air phase, that's when you want to echo that variable. The real question is, is how do I get a value into a text box? Right? Because I don't want to show I want to show the I want to show the value right in the text box. Right? I don't simply want to say you must enter a number, you entered XYZ. I want the value to be right in the text box. Think about it. Like, let's say we're validating an email address, and I typed in Mike Zeller's question mark, LorraineCCC.edu. All right, and it's like, oh, okay, I typed in a question mark instead of an ampersand. All right, I shouldn't have to retype the whole thing in. I should just be able to change the question mark to an ampersand. So ideally, I want that to appear in the text box. All right. Uh, would that text box have a text property? Okay, you are thinking ASP.NET text control, but you're right, that text box, that input type equals text will have a property. So on the first run through, if it's first time, it will load in the text box, but after that, you would want to update the value Does that make sense? Um, it makes sense. I'm, I'm just, I just want to hear you complete your thought. No, because every time, every time you load up the page, you're creating the entire form again. So even if it's the second time through, you have to output that input tag. All right. David was pretty well on the mark when he said that there would be a property on the text box. The idea is, though, the property is not a text property. The property is a value property. So if I just wanted to have any old value in there, if I wanted 1, 2, 3 in the text box, I would say value equals 1, 2, 3. And 
there's one, two, three. But I don't want one, two, three. I want whatever value they entered in. So, how do I know that? Well, again, I can do the magical thing of popping into PHP mode right here. This is why sometimes if I'm doing PHP code, if I get a little confused, I'll hard code some HTML first and make it work, and then I'll go and I'll change the hard-coded value to the real value from PHP. Now, I only want to do this if there's an error, right? So if error Then, what do I want to do? I want to echo the value in the query string for text dollars. Those of you that said that we could store it in a variable, yeah, you're right, but we already have some place for that, and that is a query string. So I can simply say echo get text dollars. I should be good to go. So I don't put anything in, boom, I get the error message. I put garbage in, after I come back I still have that garbage there. So if I put in something goofy, I wouldn't have to retype the whole thing, I just retype the piece of it. Again, this shows the magic and the difficulties with PHP. How you can literally pop PHP anywhere you want to. All right? We, in the midst of HTML, we pop in some PHP. In the middle of an attribute of HTML, we can pop in PHP. And again, taking it to an extreme, you could do the same thing with JavaScript or CSS or, or anything like that. You could change your background color based on the time of day. Could you put PHP in your JavaScript? Yes, you could put PHP in your JavaScript. The thing that you have to remember when you do that is remember how this processing works, how, how each of these languages work. Remember, PHP is run on the server to create the web page. So PHP effectively, in that case, would be writing a snippet of your JavaScript. Your JavaScript then, by the time it makes it to your browser, your JavaScript will be complete and will be JavaScript. All JavaScript, no PHP, because browsers don't understand PHP. And then your JavaScript would run. All right, it's really important to understand the... Um, the, the manner in which the client and server interact um, with PHP and JavaScript. The PHP is responsible for creating the page and sending it to the browser. Once it gets to the browser, then any JavaScript you have can run. But no PHP can run unless you submit to the server again. All right, questions? All right, let me finish up here. Um, I would suspect next week you will have a PHP quiz. Uh, I do apologize for being a little behind on the grading. Um, as you probably saw on Angel, I have some medical issues. I'm actually going in tomorrow to um, get them hopefully taken care of once and for all, which means I'll probably be out of commission for a day or two. Uh, but hopefully then we'll be coming back strong. All right. So 
Next week, we'll probably wrap up a bit about PHP. We will have the PHP quiz, uh, same way as last time. And uh, then we will get into Ajax. All right. See you over in lab. <laughs>